Folks are more than one way to skin a cat. And you've heard several ways to skin that poor cat. All right. Uh, somebody was asking perhaps for more explanation about subrogation. And uh, so the best way I can explain it to you is if you'll think of the subrogation in the, like it was a lean. And remember, lien, liens deal with titles to things. And so when, when I lien something, I'm taking the title away from over here and bring it over here to me. So it's the same thing with subrogation. If I write an insurance policy to you for, let's say, $100, and I, I'm insuring your cat, so what, what I'm doing then is when I'm subrogating from you the value of 100 over to me in the event your cat gets hurt. And so the same thing on this. <clears throat> when the state issues to an attorney an insurance policy and the attorney insures a, a commercial document such as this right here, what the attorney has done has, has it has transferred the right to the benefit that accrues from this back to the state. So that's how you subrogate something. You take the right to a thing away from the other party and you hold it. So that's the best way I can explain it, I think. Uh oh, here comes the question. <laughs> okay. So maybe you can just tell me if I've got it right based on the definition you just gave of subrogation, uh -huh. the, the example you used of a cat. If you've insured my cat, for $100, did you say that the value of that $100 uh, of the cat has just transferred to you? Yeah, I've taken $100. I've taken the value of $100 to myself based on your cat. So originally you that had... That means that you're responsible for the $100. No, no, it means I've taken it from you. I now have it. Right. So in the event that something happens to your cat, you don't pay the $100 to the cat. I pay the $100. Right. But I have the right to prosecute the party that injured the cat. See, and, and the insurance company, for instance, you know, you buy insurance for your vehicle, your car, whatever. You get into a wreck. What is the, what's the first thing the insurance company says to you? Don't talk to the other people. We're going to do the talking because we're the party who has the right to do so. We have subrogated from you the right to speak in regards to the wrecked car. It seems to me that what you've done is you've taken the liability. You have, that's exactly right. The insurance company takes the liability. Okay, when you said rights before, uh, I thought you meant uh, rights as in, as in my rights. No, no, rights and defenses on the instrument. So that gives you the liability of that. Yes, I've got the liability. Right. Okay, I'll think about that. Okay. Remember, <laughs> remember everything is in the mirror. Insurance is a, is a mirror object. And so you have to think, you have to think in, that, in that vein. It, you know, once you get, kind of get the lingo down pat and kind of get the concept fixed in your mind, you know, in, insurance becomes fairly simple. And you can do all kinds of fun things with it. <clears throat> but uh, I, I'm just trying to point out to you, that if, for those of you that don't know, that if you do go and sue somebody in court and you win, you're not going to get paid. Because, because of that bond up there, because that insurance policy, your benefit that would have come from the court case goes to this party here. Because, let me, let me show you something else. <clears throat> well, I got to write, mark some of this stuff off. Mark this off.
You have to understand that every corporation, Winston, the U.S., IBM, Homeland Security, it's all the same party. That is one party. They're all joined at the hip. So, <clears throat> if you're dealing with something that says 5th District Court on that, that and that and that is the same party. They're not different, they're not different parties. Okay. Winston, there was some, there was some good murmuring around me happening oh, cool. there. So, I thought I'd come up and say it's, no, a lot, it's a lot better than bad murmuring. I, I know. Right now, it's man. good murmuring. Well, I hear bad murmuring, I kind of listen, uh-oh, oh, big trouble here. <laughs> it was about you. Oh, oh, all right. Go ahead. You think, think you're a very handsome guy, very strapping. Uh, <laughs> moving right along. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> all right. The, uh, the point was put on that um, the plaintiff, like, sometimes does get paid. So when you say the plaintiff... Very knows, seldom. Yeah, so... We're just wondering how, like, or are they just tossing out a few shekels out of what it's of the real value of the case? Well, if if the plaintiff does get get paid, the way you would avoid that is double it's double payment. It's unjust in, it is unjust enrichment for the plaintiff to obtain anything from the suit. It's unjust enrichment because because the the real bene, beneficiary already got paid. Have any of you ever gotten from the court an original signature order? Who got it? They got it. The judge will sign an, a money order, or what you call an order. Where does it go? It goes in their vault. You'll never see it. Okay. I'm in the middle of this exact thing on, uh -huh. on a family matter, which is a civil matter. So now you've got um, plaintiff, ex-spouse. Uh-huh. I'm the defendant. Okay. And I've discovered that the, the, this is just this is exactly true. Is the order is the money. Now yep. I don't have it. That's correct. They've got it, and uh -huh. I'm trying to get it back, even using the queen and everything else, right? And they're fighting like crazy uh, to keep this under wraps. Now, how am I? How am I? Where, where should I be going with this? <laughs> well, now you're starting to ask me for legal advice. No, no, no. I, yeah. No, no. no I, I'm kidding with you. <laughs> <laughs> I do not want legal advice from anybody, all right? No, what you're, uh, uh, so you're trying to figure out some way to, to get, get that piece of paper back. Which piece of paper? The order. Uh, chances of getting it back are about a you know, billion to one, yeah, however. I'm, I, they are backing up, I can tell. So I, well, I'm, I'm, what I'm suggesting to you is a strategy you might use to get get an original signature piece of paper, and that is get your bonds in order, get your bonds put in place in that case, and then go back and file a uh, petition to vacate a void order. So should I put a bigger bond in than the whole, the whole mess? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, your bonds, go, the bond we're going to teach you is going to be an unlimited bond, so when you put that in, it's going to, be, it's going to act like a replevin against theirs. I mean, I've even used the Bible against them in, in Leviticus. There's a thing where if somebody finds something or takes it, or like yeah. it's, it's ironclad, right? You've got to give it back plus 20%, so now I'm asking for 20% on top of this thing. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> Only 20? Well, that's because that's what, the, that's what it okay. says there, right? All right. So. But yeah, the, the, the strategy, I would, I, the, I, one strategy you might use you get your bonds you know, in place and in the court, and then come back and vacate the original order and demand a new order. Now, that new order has to come to you because you're the party that bonded to get right. it. It's, all, it's all basically about salvage. It's, an, it's all in the admiralty. Yeah, well, they think they found something. They think but they I, found but something. But I said, I know you found it. Give it back. That's and correct. They're, and they're, they're still like tr trying to pretend like but see, But see, you have to indemnify them against any harm before they'll do it for you. Okay. So that's why we're putting insurance policies into the court to indemnify the court because they won't do anything for you unless, unless you provide them a, a remedy. You, know, you understand the court is, is mercenary. They're, they're mercenaries. 
And that is, that is, they won't do something for nothing. And so you, got to, you have to give them something, and you're going to have to indemnify them against any harm that might come to them for doing something for you. Why would they do anything for you? Why should they? What did you give them? See what I mean? I, I made the statement before, you, you, you only get as good a government as what you pay for. And they're mercenaries. You only get you only get a hired gun. You know the, the quality of your hired gun is only be depends on your pocketbook. So pay them, give them an indemnity, send them a bond. We we'll talk about that a little bit further. Anyway, uh, we we was talking about that scenario right there to demonstrate several things to you. Uh, I think pretty much we beat that to death a little bit. Uh, now, this kind of looks like a civil matter here, but let's, let's go into a criminal matter so, so you understand how the criminal side of the court works. And that is, you understand that uh, basically everything is civil, but, it, but they have different things to satisfy in order to get the criminal and so forth. And I'll give you an example of it. Uh, um, one of my uh, children, uh, decided he was going to go try some of this stuff out. Of course, he didn't have very much experience with it or knowledge, so he get he got jammed up pretty quick. And that was he used a sight draft to go buy a vehicle. Well, here we go, you know. <laughs> Use a sight draft to go and buy a vehicle off the internet. Took delivery and everything. Oh boy. Well, anyway, so they charged him. Well, they, they put complaints in against him. <clears throat> So we went, we went and did the uh, acceptor for value routine on the complaint. And so when they had the arraignment, the kid goes in and tells the magistrate, you know, the Levitical magistrate, he says, he says, I have accepted, and I said, I have settled this matter. The magistrate looks at him kind of crazy, you know, because he didn't know, he, didn't, you know, he was shocked. Well, the prosecutor had the right answer. He jumped up and said, you may have settled it civilly. Said, but you have not settled it criminally. So that what the prosecutor was saying, we said on this particular matter, said we have a civil side, we have a criminal side. And he says you you accepted it over here, which means you settle it on the civil side. But he says you have not resolved the criminal part of it over here. And so what what must he have done then on the criminal side? No, he had to plead guilty. Now, this always gets a shock in people's face when I say this. <laughs> what, is, what is the only thing you can do in a criminal matter? You can only plead guilty. If you plead anything else, you're in contempt of court. Remember, we are in the mirror. We operate in bankruptcy. So when you operate that way, you cannot do a dishonor. And, and so if you go into the court, the judge asks you, how do you plead? If you get that far and you want to plead, some of you might not want to plead, but the only plea that you can successfully put in without going into contempt of court is guilty. I plead guilty to the facts. I plead guilty to the facts. Now, <clears throat> if you have no facts in there, you're really in trouble. <laughs> so what do you have to do? Let me, let me explain to you about, about the court and going down to the courthouse. Never go to the court until you've settled all the issues. Never go to court until you have settled all of the issues. When you go to the court, Take the law and the facts with you. Take the law and the facts with you. Which means that you will have had to exhaust your remedies before you go there. See what I mean? Now the attorneys typically do not exhaust. They typically go in and hope the judge will rescue them for their incompetence. But if you go down to the courthouse, the judge is not going to rescue you. You have to have the law and the facts before you go down there. Now,
back to it again, folks. The agreement of the parties. Well, that should be. Yes. Is the law of the contract. An agreement equals facts. And so you have to get the other party into an agreement before you ever go to court. Otherwise, it's contempt. It's contempt of court to go down to the courthouse unprepared. Okay, you got five minutes. Go ahead and change the tape, and then we'll we're rolling again. Go ahead. Um, my question was um, because they, they, they want you to do three things, plead guilty, not guilty, or stay your plea. So uh, I've done that like five times now. Um, stayed your plea? St uh, yeah. I mean, so does the, is that in contempt, or is that kind of neutralized that? Kind well, they're letting you get away with it, so it must not be contempt. Okay. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> So you have to get into an agreement, which means you have to... What's the easiest way to get into an agreement with the other party? Accept their offer for value. That's all you got to do. Accept their value for offer. I mean, their offer for value. I have here... Let's see, get this thing going here. Figure out how to do this. Ain't this cool? Huh? No, I'm never right on that one. Now, if you will take if you will take a presentment and accept it for value, you become holder in due course. And you have to be the holder in due course of a document in order to be able to execute it. Coming through. It's just, it's just warming up. It takes a minute to warm up. We think. There it comes. It's starting to come up a little bit. I gotta tell you guys, this is a cool device here. It's still coming up. Gotta warm up a little bit. Got this mouse here. Where'd it go? Huh? Oh, that's right. You gotta keep holding the thing down, don't you? Okay, here is a typical acceptance for value. This one we did against a county attorney. Let's see if I can scroll it up here just a little bit. Well, I ain't doing it. Yeah, I'll have to. Yeah, I'll go down here, I guess. Well, the wheel don't work. There we go. I'm getting the body of the thing here for you. All right. Uh, in this particular case, we were accepting for value a, uh, an information. Now, you understand what an information is? It, it's, a, it's a hearsay indictment. That's all it is. But in any event, here's the language you used. Uh, I received your offer, State of Utah, plaintiff versus John A. Smith, defendant, information, criminal number, blah, 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 and did not find a check. Can you believe they would do something like that? They didn't send me the check for it? Now, that's something I haven't uh, perhaps given to you yet, but you got to understand, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Remember, this, this, this is a maxim. Write it on the inside of your eyeballs or something so you won't forget this. And that is, whoever creates a liability has to bring the remedy. Whoever creates the liability has to bring the remedy to the problem. And so a presentment was made by an attorney to John. And John says, thank you very much for what you gave me, but you didn't give me enough. You didn't give me any way to solve the problem. So where's my check? Or if you're not going to give me a check, have you written out a replevin bond? Give me that. I don't care what you do. But in any event, I did not find a check. I did not find a replevin bond enclosed. Therefore, I am accepting your offer and returning your money order for settlement of this account. 
Now this is kind of like a ping pong match. You know, the ball keeps going back and forth across the table. Whoever has the ping pong ball is the debtor in this relationship. So he served me. So I took and served it back. Now he's the debtor. First off, he was a creditor, I'm the debtor. Now he's a debtor, I'm the creditor. See? Ping pong, back and forth all the time. Now, <clears throat> please close this account immediately and make the adjustments. Provide me with a certificate of release. This serves notice that this account is accepted for value. This property is exempt from levy. Please adjust this account for the proceeds, products, accounts, and fixtures, and all good and valuable considerations, and release the order to me immediately. I'm requesting your taxpayer ID number. Please complete and return the IRS Form W-9 and uh, with the appropriate 1099 OID, which I'm not going to go into. Anyway, additionally, this census proceeding may involve a disputed title. Please identify for me the person who is a fiduciary debtor and who is a fiduciary creditor of this account. Now, if you were an attorney and you got this back, what in the world would you do? <laughs> You'd probably chuck it in the trash. You probably would. But that would be a bad thing to do. Because this is a document here how legitimately he has to, to use to settle and close the account. We're given we're given the ability to do it. Now let's see here. Would you have to have a bond in place? What's that? Would you have to substantiate your bond in place? Yeah, that we we used to just simply tell the attorneys or whoever to use our exemption to settle it, and truly they did not know how to do that, and so. Uh, Probably the CPA at the court would know how to do it, but the attorneys didn't know how. And so we, at that point, we stopped telling them, you know, use our exemption to do it, and then we started providing bonds or promissory notes. We'll go into that a little bit later. But here are, do we have any accountants in here? Can I ask a quick question? Sure, go ahead. This, does this same process apply if you're dealing with, let's say, the Canada Revenue Agency and you get a letter from the head of the Canada Revenue Agency? Absolutely. You can accept it for value and ask them for the check. That's your only remedy, folks. Yes. Believe it or not, that's your <laughs> only remedy. All right, so this, <laughs> this one here starts out. Do we have any accountants in here? Surely there's got to be an accountant in here. Well, th these are accounting instructions. I am not an accountant, so I can't explain all the things here, but here are the instructions that could be used by an accountant to back out and, 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 and create the zero balance. So it goes something like these enclosed, the notice of my acceptance, written payment, blah, blah, blah. These adjustments include prepaid expenses, the transfer of a net purchase, blah, blah. I'm, I'm not going to go through all this. I just put it up here for your amusement. I'm, if there's an accountant here, they might be able to explain all this. This is involved with what's called intermediate, intermediary accounting, intermediate accounting. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how to do that. But anyway, uh, along with the acceptance letter, this letter here could be used along with that so that they would have the appropriate instructions so they could, in fact, back that, back that account out and, 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 and destroy the liability. That's what I'm saying. Now, we're, we're, we're going to produce a CD... Uh, for everybody that's going to have all this stuff on here. Okay. And the audio one? Uh, along with the audio, we're going to give a, a CD that will have all of these templates, all the, all the documents on it, so you can look at them. But anyway, I'm just giving you an example here of, a, of an accepted for value of a court case. Now, when this gets sent back to the attorney, uh, what, what does he have the liability to do? And if he does not do it, then who has to who has to be penalized or who has to pay the tab on the court case? The attorney does. Now I will remind you again that acceptance for value is private administrative remedy. It's private. So you have to bring it into the bank or into the court for conversion. So this is the kind of thing here that you would want to bring into evidence in the court you're dealing with. And 
if you wanted to put extra teeth into it, that affidavit of non-response or the notary's uh, certification of non-response with this really sees the thing up pretty good. This looks real good. But, but, <laughs> but when they throw it away. Ooh. Well, I don't want to lose that step. So what you're saying is, is that when they throw it away, what do you do? Yes. Oh, let's see. Do you show up? <laughs> do you show up in court? Yes. The same, the day that the yeah, action you, is supposed to take place. You, you have sent to show this up. a week ahead of time. Uh huh. So now you delivered this to the the prosecuting attorney's got it. Yeah. What what I would do is uh, on the day of the court, I would come and I would go inside the bar and I would walk over to the plaintiff's table. Because having accepted the case for value, I am now super plaintiff. I'm holder in due course on that thing. So I would go over, and we've had guys do this. And the attorney, prosecutor, what are you doing here? Well, I'm the plaintiff in this matter. I've accepted this thing for value, and I'm here to state my position. Now, who wins all court cases, folks? The plaintiff. The plaintiff does. So the super plaintiff comes in and says, I, hey, Your Honor, I'm appearing here as super plaintiff on this matter. We have this problem with this guy right here. <laughs> Number one, get him out of my chair. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say. But then, then you operate as if, in fact, you are the plaintiff, because you are. So, yeah, go, to, go show up down there. You know, so you come into the plaintiff and say, Your Honor, it's obvious what's going on here. Look at all these things. And by the way, for and on the record, here's what I've done. Put all this stuff into evidence. Now, what I want for you to do is to uh, go and find for me the fiduciary debtor, and throw him in jail. Now, who is the fiduciary debtor now? The attorney. So either he's got to pay up, or he's got to go to jail like everybody else. Now, we uh, introduced, oh, three or four years, about three years ago, I guess, the concept of appointing uh, attorney's fiduciaries. And we've had... We've had Mixed success with that, but we've had some pretty good fun with it and so forth. But uh, the attorneys know exactly what that is. And even though they'll try to buffalo you and try to, you know, get you to think something else, they know what it is. And so if, in fact, we have gone and appointed some party, the fiduciary debtor, and I come in as plaintiff, I'm going to exert my right as a plaintiff and say, look, Your Honor, this guy over here is in contempt. And you know as well as I do, Your Honor, that this court can sanction for contempt. You do it all the time. <clears throat> so what, would you do, what I want you to do with the fiduciary debtor, I want you to throw him in jail until he settles this thing. Now, do you need me to bond up your, your commitment order? I've already indemnified the court for $300 million. Do you need me to write another bond? I will be happy to. Because, see, the judge actually needs a bond in order to write up a commitment order. And so do you need another bond besides the one I've given you? If you do, I'll, I'll have it for you here in just five minutes. See? Because I need this guy either to pay up or get thrown in the slammer. And I'll, I'll, bond, I'll bond your action in that matter. No problem to me. See, you got to take control of the thing down at the courthouse, folks. You can't let them run it. you got to take the control and be in charge. And make no mistakes about it, see? So I'm coming in here, and this is how I'm coming in. Now, this, this acceptance for value is, is good technology. It works. You can, you can operate it just that way. But, but remember, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's uh, the acceptance for value is on the private side, so you have to pass it through onto the public and so forth. Just, just do it right, and I think you won't have any problems with it. Is there any questions about acceptance for value? Did anybody... Is there anybody here who does not understand it? Or do we need to hammer at it some more? There comes a couple of questions, so we're going to hammer at it some more. Do you have to read that uh, into the record when you're in the court? You can. I would. Because I heard that it, it's not really, he doesn't see it until it's read in, even if you put right. it in. That's right. Okay. Yeah, I just, like I say, walk into the court and get behind the plaintiff's table. Matter of fact, might want to make you up one of the little name cards. Put down, you know, everybody's got name cards, so uh, we we do that. 
We, we put our names on there, you know, plaintiff, that kind of thing. Yeah. This, uh, I've already had a number of issues resolved in my head as a result of what we've already gone over, uh, whether it be criminal matters, uh, financial matters, uh, attachments, what have you. The only area where I'm still not clear on how I can find remedy is to do with getting my daughter back. Does this have any relevance to that kind of issue? Yep. Okay. I, uh, I'm sure we'll get there. Thanks. Yeah. We may have a chance to address that particular thing. I don't know. Uh, I'm surprised there's no question about accepted for value. Okay, why does accepted for value work? Takes away the contract. That does all those things. But look, <clears throat> go, go, back, go back to your, your contracts and that kind of stuff. If, if a liability exists and somebody makes an offer of performance, the offer of performance does what to the liability? Yeah, it, it settles it. Offer of performance. So if somebody says, Here, here's a liability. What are you going to do? You say, well, I accept your offer. I accept your offer to contract. I'm returning the piece of paper with my signature on By the way, when we accept things for value, we write things on them. For instance, if that was a court document that we were doing acceptance on, we would typically... I don't have a red pen. Do it in blue. Well, you can't see it back over the camera, can you? Oh, that's okay. Can't, the camera won't be able to see it, that's what I'm saying. Go ahead. Just one quick question, uh -huh. uh, Winston. If you have a lawyer involved in the case, can you just uh, apply all this stuff and uh, sidestep the lawyer, or do you have to fire the lawyer first? What do you want to fire him for? Get him in there. Yeah. You got to have somebody go to jail, don't you? Yeah, true. <laughs> we'll get rid of him. Bring him on in there. Anyway, if, if, you, if you had a court document such as a complaint like this here describes and you wanted to do the acceptance, you'd just take the court document and you, you could write acceptance for value. We always write it diagonally because that's the tradition. Then I, I like to write exempt from levy. Then I might sign the thing, the regular signature, put the date on the thing, 11.30, whatever. And that's technically sufficient, but then we, sometimes we go a little bit further and write down our exemption ID number so they know what the pass-through account is. In your case up here, it would be something like this. That kind of thing, you know. That's your SIN number? Yeah, that's your SIN number. That's what it'll be our social security number. Birth and so, uh, I think SIN number. Yeah. Uh-huh. Just a comment on the social security, a comment on the social security number. I received a, I'm not sure I should have received it, but I did get it back from the Canada Revenue Agency that had the digits for the social security number, but it had it in another space that said account number with no spaces. That's okay. They just need, you know, I'm just drawing it out for you. I generally don't put any spaces at all in anything. Okay. The computers won't. <clears throat> okay, so you write that on. Now, when I was released, they give you all the charges on that. Do you, can you write it on that, or do you need to go down to the court clerk and get a certified? True copy, not a not the copy you get when you're released. The copy you got when you're released is fine. It is sure. So the, that's that long legal paper that has all the charges listed. I guess that would okay. That would be or the, or the original complaint. Well, yeah, that was the complaint. Okay, yeah, that that's it then. Because it's well, they turned it into a criminal thing. Okay, yeah, that's what I would accept. But anyway, the, the, the original document itself that's been accepted for value along with a letter similar to this and perhaps the accounting instructions in the United States we might include 
a W-9 form because the W-9 form identifies who they are because we're wanting to know what their tax identification number is too. So we, was, we typically send them a copy of that and then we would request 1099 OID from them. So okay. when you accept it for value, do you attach this letter with it? Yeah. Okay, and then you send it to the prosecutor's office? Yeah. Okay, and then you show up at court with them and enter it in verbally. Yeah, and it'd be a good thing to show up with a uh, certification of non-response. Yeah, from the notary. Yeah, the, a notary giving you the non-response or an affidavit saying that, you know, that so-and-so here didn't, didn't respond to this. Matter of fact, you might want to go to the clerk of the court and say, you know, has, has attorney so-and-so settled this case? The clerk's going to say no. Mm-hmm. Okay. That kind of thing. See what I mean? Because you, you want the evidence there that the attorney didn't do what, like what he was told to do. And so, uh, get after this business here. Please adjust this account for the products, proceeds, and so forth, and release the order to me immediately. It means give me the check or else. Um, do you need to do acceptance for values on the original copies only, or let's say in the mail sometimes you get invoices, statements, and asking for yeah, whatever? Any, any copy. So you can accept for value anything, a blue copy, whatever. Here's right here what gives it the real value is when you put your wedding signature on there. Right. It, tur it turns it into a firm offer. So any piece of paper, basically. Yeah. What happens when you take a piece of paper and write acceptor for value and all this language on it, you have turned that piece of paper into currency. Right. You turn it into hard currency with your signature. And you don't have to put on there exempt or um, return for settlement and discharge. That's just taken for granted. Oh, you, you can write a whole book on there if right. you want to, okay. but this, this here will probably get it. Now, there's other, other things we'll do later on I'll tell, tell you about in relationship to the birth certificate and bonds and stuff. But for this kind of presentment right here, this ought to be sufficient. Uh huh. So when Revenue Canada sends you that piece of paper, it says uh, requirement to pay. That's a real bill? You just write that on that requirement to pay? Yeah. You don't have to send them back and send them, send them a... You don't write them a letter and tell them, send me a real bill or anything? Don't need to. No? Okay. Remember, remember, they're only looking for the adjustment of the account. And that all you're doing is allowing them to do that by creating... But it, it's, it's all Wizard of Oz stuff, folks. <laughs> this is all Wizard of Oz junk. So when you write that on there, and you, on their requirement to pay scrap paper, and you send it back to them, what are they supposed to do with it? What are they supposed to do? I don't care what to do with it. But they just send you another one. Then oh, accept that and send it back to them. It goes on forever. That's right. Not necessarily. Until they clean up your bank account. I don't think so. It does here. Well, they don't keep anything in the bank. We'll talk about banks in a minute, matter of fact. I need to explain to you about banks. You know, you've you got a funny view of them. This is just a joke sending this stuff to Revenue Canada. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I haven't found it to be one yet. Well, it had, I've sent the Raven can over and over and over. Nothing happens. They just keep, keep attacking you. In 2004, now they're sending me the same crap back. For, they dealt with the 2004. They added more interest to it. Okay. The, I tell you what let's do. When we get into bonding, well, I'm sure we had to liquidate them. Now, I, I want to tell you something. That we had some of those problems years ago with the IRS. And we started liquidating the IRS. In one year, we liquidated them for $400 billion. And all of a sudden, things changed. <laughs> and so probably what you need to do with RCA, or what do you call it, RCA, CRA, or whatever it is, I think you need to start liquidating them through the international. I think probably things will change. Well, they've changed their name three times in the last seven years. It used to be called Canada Revenue, then it became CCRA, and now it's Revenue Canada. Do you just use the most current one because they've accepted the liability of all the previous corporations. They got the liability. But if, if they're doing that kind of trick, liquidate them. Yeah. We did, and things changed. Okay. So, Winston, when we were talking uh, yesterday, uh, just a question about this letter here and the forms. Uh huh. Because we were like, uh, what we were asking amongst us was, you know, do we use a Canadian equivalent, or and, I, and we were suggesting going into the international with the R IRS forms. Uh -huh. So I, don't, I imagine that question's out there as well. But I would certainly like to know: can we use a Canadian form, or should we just kind of go with this and, and see? Well, you can go. You can go the Canadian way if you can find the equivalent uh, documents and 
uh, institutions. Which might, would lead to my next question. If anyone here knows what those equivalents are, I, sh I would sure like to know too. There's he does. Uh, the best understanding I have amongst the people that I network with is there is no Canadian equivalent to the 1099 OID. And after some discussion, not personally, someone I know discussing this with CRA, um, if you wanted to or you felt you need to, you could just make up your own. But really there's no need to because it's something that is their responsibility, not ours. We don't need to bother with it. If they want it, they can make it up. Okay. So there's several ways you can go with all that. Well, anyway, uh, what I brought this issue up for you to understand is that when somebody makes you an offer in the public under bankruptcy, the only viable remedy you have is to accept it. If you do anything else except accept, uh, you're in dishonor. And uh, it, it's the dishonor that leads to the liquidation. This, there's another phrase you ought to put in your thinking caps. And remember this too. We use this all the time. Your dishonor creates the funds in the involuntary bankruptcy. Your dishonor creates the funds in the involuntary bankruptcy. And so if you do a dishonor, you just, you just opened yourself wide open for liquidation. That's why I was saying in the, in the public, if somebody makes you an offer, your only remedy to stay in honor is to accept it. That's all you can do. You can accept it and return it to them for the settlement. If you do anything else other than that, you're in dishonor. Now let me explain to you the concept of guilty. A guilty plea in the criminal court is almost the exact same thing as acceptance for value. It's guarantee of payment. If you say I'm guilty, what you're saying is, is I guarantee payment. If you say accepted for value, you're saying I guarantee payment. And so if you get into a court situation, you always, you, always want to, you always want to get to the place where you can plead guilty. On your terms. Guilty to the facts. And you better have some facts in there. You better have the facts in there. <laughs> See what I mean? But you're in, in the criminal venue, you're trying to get to the place where you can plead guilty. Now, if you're not prepared to plead guilty yet then you're not going to plead anything until you get it all satisfied. Uh -huh. Is that a guilty plea in a criminal case, in a criminal matter where you're likely to go to jail? Yeah. Uh, but you're not going to go to jail because why? You've already settled it. You've already got it settled. Which means that you have got the account zeroed out. Or you shifted liability to somebody else. You can do that too by appointing somebody fiduciary. Appointing the attorney fiduciary. We do that all the time. Or if the judge enters a plea on your behalf. Uh-huh, that's, that's when I go after his bonds. Is, is, is doing an acceptance for value a settlement, basically? Yes. It's a payment for them? And are they guilty of this honor when they ask you for, let's say, some funds or whatever, without providing a remedy for you? Yes. So, so there's actually two dishonors involved, theirs and yours? Could, there could be two dishonors involved. But they choose yours to get the uh, could be. To, to get the funds. Uh -huh. Remember, could you choose, can you get them to settle the fund because of their dishonor? Well, of course. Right. Okay. <laughs> we want to be nice folks to everybody. Wait, go ahead. I have a notice of assessment here from uh, Canada Revenue Agency for the 
mm -hmm. 2006 tax year and at the bottom here the tear off portion that they oh. want you to send back yeah it's a remittance voucher oh, cool so yeah you can make it for yeah. value write that on there send them a letter like this yeah I would go ahead and accept this for value yeah and you know and uh, send that back yeah okay along with all along with all your acceptance yeah yeah right on and yeah, we've done that plenty of times you don't have to send them anything though right? no I mean, you, you can only just send oh, don't, don't, yeah, don't send me any money. No, Crown, no. I don't do that. <laughs> no, I mean, do, we, do we actually have to, could you just do that acceptance for value and just send it like that without adding that? You could, but. Because it, that's just informing them how to do it, right? Yeah, th th this was styled right here for the United States about the W-9 and the 1099 right. and all that stuff. So but you don't have to do that. They won't be confused from him just saying that. They shouldn't that. be. Right, and they if they are, be. they're just playing stupid. I mean, they're playing stupid. They're playing stupid, yeah. When I've been returning assessments uh, accepted for value, I return them directly to the commissioner of the Canada Revenue Agency personally. Okay, and I make sure I have evidence copies in my possession that I've done that. Now, what I'm going to suggest, this is something that I've picked up since I'd be here, so that I, I know that they have all the documents, is when you go to the post office and get everything registered, bring your digital camera, okay? <laughs> Take a picture of all the Bleakin documents with the registration number on, including the letter of direction, so that the, there's not a problem if it ever gets to a court case. Okay, that'd be good. Okay. Before you do this, you need the bond on? Who said that? <laughs> Boy, try, try and get me in trouble. Before you do this, you should have the bond in place? Yeah, we, we actually need to go and start talking about bonds by trying to build up to it. But I'm suggesting to you, you need to get bonds in before we do as, this. As the foundational issue of everything you do. And that's really the reason when, they, when we put everything into acceptance for value and gave it to the CRA, they didn't accept it, they ignored it. And Maybe, proceeded. But, but without the bond, you didn't have any way to enforce it. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. You have to have our paperwork in order before we can go and liquidate that. Once we're in order, they're in default, it, and you can prove it, then you can liquidate it. That's right. It'd be best. And we, we, we've been liquidating for a long time and probably doing it improperly, but it worked pretty good. Okay. You suggest to take a... Uh, camera and, and take pictures? No, he did. I did. Oh, he did. Okay. With uh, Canada Post, we can get these little stickers. You can get them by the handful and you can put down your registration number right on the letter. Would that suffice to to, to doing that? Well, I don't know. Here comes the answer. He's got okay. it. I'm just sort of suggesting you do both because if somebody says one of the documents isn't in the envelope that you sent by registered mail to the appropriate person at Canada Revenue Agency. You have proof that it was put there. Okay? okay. Let's face it, we know that, now I'm, I'm hoping once we learn more about bonding this afternoon that we will further solidify our activity, but we'll see. Okay. Here we go. Being a recovered paper terrorist. <laughs> 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 I'm going to maybe just use the whiteboard and Winston's mic to show you uh, guys what we do that works quite effectively if you want. Yes. Go ahead and race that stuff off. Need to. Well, let's get on. Hey, Dean, well, let's get on your uh, recording. They can't hear, but they can't hear you. Okay. You're going to have to use both of them. I'm just going to start this, and then I'll explain it. I'm just going to write it on the board here real quick. You want to, you want to race some of that stuff off? Okay, I'm sure it's going to do it.
sorry. <laughs> um, you can just hold up that letter for a white piece of paper. What we generally do is we take the presentment and we put right across the top right corner here the RT number. Right? The RT number? RWRT, when you do registered mail. And then that will be have the number that it's going to be mailed with. So this document, when they sign, has, has everybody sent registered mail? You can go online and pick it up, get the signatures on it. The registered mail number, this is what they're receiving in the mail, is this document, because it has the registered mail number on it. So you take the letter, you write the, the RT, or they're all RW nouns, but the registered mail sticker, we write it right on the presentment so that they know what they're getting. And then we make a copy of it. Then what we do is a proof of contents, and we say enclosed in this letter is presentment accepted for value, bond, bills of exchange, whatever you're going to put in there. So this is going to be autographed with two verifications or notary, and then we also get the notary or however we're doing it, the same, do it all at once, right? The notary, whoever comes, you know, so-and-so comes before me, and they've got this presentment and it's autographed by me and inside the envelope is going to be the presentment, the acceptance, the bill, whatever you're going to add and they autograph that also and I'm going to, I'm going to witness them, put, you know, I'm going to sit here until they put it in the envelope and seal it. And the envelope will be registered. So you prepare the envelope also, who it's from, who it's to. And this portion is already put on the envelope. So the notary or the witnesses can verify these documents are all being put into this envelope bearing this registered mail tag, right? <laughs> you make a photocopy of the envelope and we put this, this portion on here. And on here you can peel off the little stickers. You take this sticker and you peel it on here, right underneath where you've written the RT number. So now this all gets sealed and you have a complete copy of everything you're sending with an original red number. Canada Post will only stamp their red numbers. So now when we go into Canada Post, this all gets mailed. I have the red sticker here and I have the red sticker here. So they will stamp this and they will also stamp the presentment. So that date stamps, I've got now got a copy of what was put in the envelope, everything that was put in the envelope. I have a Canada Post stamped registered mail, so I have a date proof that this letter did get mailed this day. And I have the envelope that it got sent with. And then what we do is we go online. And if you look up through Canada Post, a delivery certificate, you can get all the information. And then you can also pull up the uh, PDF, I guess you guys know what I'm saying, I can't, I'm sure you can't see it on camera, but the PDF you can actually pull up also. But we also make sure that we click the signature and we put that all into a Word document. And the laws of signature is if somebody gives you a negotiable instrument and with a signature on it, you can use that signature for whatever you want. So you can, if you know his bank account, you can write checks on his bank account. Now. So. Don't do that though. Don't do that though. <laughs> not, it's not legal advice. <laughs> so then what we do when we do the non-response, what we do, we prepare this paperwork, we do the copy right away, we just pull the stickers off, bang, 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 we get this all put together, we go to the post office, we stamp that, and we stamp, you know, where the sticker is, we stamp that, and then we do the non-response up. And then what we do is we do an acceptance of their signature with the non-response. So they can't say they didn't get it because here we've given them this and then we're proving to them that they've got it with the non-response. So all of this is just bang. And now, of course, we do the same thing here. Copy of the non-response with the RT number on it again. And we, we just keep going. So the, whenever they get one document, it just zigzags right back to their original presentment, what they've given you. So it just it flows all the way from beginning to end. Does that make sense? So that's one thing that we've done. Canada Post won't stamp anything that isn't their sticker, so you got to get these ahead of time. Just pull their stickers off. They, they can't pull off more than that one because they need two for their internal tracking, So, but they will let you pull that one off and then just get it all stamped by them. So that might help with some of the paperwork process. Uh, questions?
I guess you must have explained it correctly then. Now let's see if I can get it back up here. Give me a sec here. Yeah. Gonna need something. The cotton picker won't go back on. I'll get it. No, that's okay. There, that's there it goes. Yeah. This mirror thing should be a little bit easier. Okay, we're back. Go ahead. Well, I, I wrote to the Attorney General on time and they, you know, lost the letter. So I resent it. And what I've done, a real simple way, is I get three, three copies. I send it again. And then I give him a copy. And I tell him to write his own letter saying that he's sending it on my behalf. And then I get him to do it. He writes on my behalf. All of a sudden, <laughs> they found the first letter. So it's just a matter of getting witnesses. And these are two witnesses. They've gone down to the post office. It's just unreasonable to think that three P, three letters didn't get there. Like, it's just, it's not, it's not reasonable. Yeah, there you go. There's another way to skin that cat. Oh, you got another cat skinner. But, but also in the, in the, uh, uh, in the, in the, in the, what is that, the when you write, uh, what is that called, the bonds, uh, the, the code book, it says that when they present, uh, when you present stuff by mail, it doesn't matter to them if it gets there or not. As long as you sent it in mail, it doesn't have to be registered or not. It says that that's good enough for them. If a company sends it to you and they don't even have your right address, that's good enough for them to put a lien on you. You don't have to do any of that other stuff. Sure. It's as simple as that. That's but we would, we would Bills really, of exchange, that's what it's written in. Yeah, we would really prefer to, do, to get the deal done. So, uh, you know, go ahead and do all you can to make sure that, you know, things get where they ought to, to be. I mean, uh, all right, we got on to all that stuff because of what? Because you're guilty. Because <laughs> you're guilty, yeah. Do you understand the guilty plea now? Yeah. <clears throat> now, uh, as proof that a guilty is the proper plea to make, if you go into a court with an attorney, what will the attorney invariable, invariably plead? No, not guilty. <laughs> what does that tell you? And so if you plead not guilty, what are your chances of going to jail? Very good. Very, very good. And so that's the wrong thing to do, obviously. You know? What, what do they say the definition of insanity is? Doing the same thing over and over. And expecting Doing the same thing over and over the same way and expecting a different result. So you're going down to the courthouse, you're pleading not guilty, and the judge says, off to jail you go. What do you think is going to happen next time you do that? Same thing, you're going off to jail. So, <clears throat> now if you, if you, and let, let me explain to you first off about pleading. Number one, you have to realize that if you plea in the court, you're asking for a benefit privilege. You got to get that straight right up front. And so you, yeah, you're asking for a benefit privilege when you plead. Matter of fact, any time you use a court to settle your problems, you're asking for a benefit privilege, which makes you a debtor. Now, in a, in a civil matter, it's pretty simple. In a criminal matter, criminal matter, it's a little bit more difficult. And that is, is that you, they're, they're trying to rush you to judgment. They want to get you into jail as quick as they can get you there because it saves them all that headache. And so you do not want to let them rush you to judgment because you need time to settle. And so typically what we do, we do it in the, in the civil, we do it in the criminal the same way. Well, excuse me, but I have not had an opportunity to exhaust my remedies. I have not had a chance to exhaust my administrative remedies. And, the judge, and at that point, the judge knows that if he goes forward, all of a sudden now he has denied you due process. 
and a due process issue in our in our legal system and so forth is a is a, a overturnable issue. So the judge don't want to get reversed, and so he's going to give you time then to settle up. Now I, I always like to say, well, ask for 120 days. They're not going to give you 120 days because if it runs past 120 days, they lose jurisdiction. <laughs> so if you can trick somebody into it, go ahead and do it. And maybe not thinking, that, okay, 120 days. So you come back to the court and they lost jurisdiction. But anyway, uh, typically, you know, you might get 90 days. Now, how long will it take you to uh, exhaust your administrative remedies? Technically. Two or three days. Two or three days. And there are other things you might want to do. You might want to put in uh, counter offers. You might want to get other things going on. For instance, let's say you send this back to the attorney. The attorney does not respond. You get the certification non-response from the notary or you create the, the non-response. You understand non-response creates an estoppel. Estoppel. Estoppel means they can go no further. The matter has been settled and they cannot proceed any further. And to, and to try to get around an estoppel is contempt of court. So once you get the other party into an estoppel, now they got a problem. And so that would be the very best scenario uh, when you're trying to exhaust your administrative remedies is to get the, get the uh, other party into an estoppel. Now the, the failure to respond creates the estoppel. And when you, then when you go into court, you say, Your Honor, I am relying upon the estoppel as my remedy. And so what's the judge going to do then? Is he going to deny you remedy? He can't. That is your remedy. And so we use estoppel all the time. And it's a very, very effective thing to use. But in any event, when you're trying to exhaust your administrative remedies, take your time and get it all done properly. You know, go through the procedures to get all the evidence and everything so you get the thing lined up. And then once you have the agreement of the other party, now you're prepared to plead guilty. Now you're prepared to plead guilty. Oh, that sounds tricky. Well, I'm just trying to tell you. It's scary. Well, it is kind of scary when you first think about it. However, I think you'll have to agree to me after everything is said and done that guilty is the only plea you can make. I'm telling you, if you plead not guilty, it's contempt of court because you are guilty. Because you are the creditor of the national bankruptcy and the creditor has ultimate liability to settle all the accounts. So when you come in there and they see you, you see that you're a living, breathing, sentient being, they know that you have to be the creditor in the matter. And they know the debtor is a straw man. But they also know that the creditor, not the debtor, the creditor has the liability to settle the accounts. And this, is, this has been one of the big uh, uh, failings when, when we've gone into court and fooled around with them people. And that is that you, let me tell you again, you, not the prosecutor, has the liability to settle the matter. You have to provide the remedy because you're the creditor. Uh huh. Uh, before you step across the bar and you, uh, I've heard that you can say, I have no intention of bringing contempt or dishonor to this courtroom, would that not alleviate then sure. getting in uh, a contempt of court if you pleaded not guilty? Well, not, not guilty is, is, is not a contempt. That, it, that's staying in honor. Not oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Other way around. Right, right. But no, you, you can't say one thing and do something else. You can't say, I have no intention of going into contempt, but I'm going to plead not guilty. That's an oxymoron. Mm -hmm. okay. you, you'd be in contempt for lying. Uh -huh. haven't, haven't we sort of been programmed to believe that we have a justice system and that there is guilty and not guilty when, in fact, there isn't? Yeah, see, you're getting back, uh, probably a lot of our thought process evolved out of the common law. 
Because in common law, you can put in a plea of innocent. That, 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 that plea does not exist in the Admiralty. 1973, they got rid of it in Canada. Yeah, there's no such thing as innocent. And so uh, I think, you know, probably your thought process is still kind of fading in and out of common law a little bit. But, but in Admiralty, a guilty plea is the only thing you can say. Because in, in Admiralty, everything is summary judgment. In Admiralty, there is no jury. See? In, in Admiralty, the only thing you can plead is guilty. Because it goes back to this. And uh, I like to ask this question. Do we have any soldiers of the sea here? We don't have any soldiers of the sea? I used to be a soldier of the sea. I used to be. Yeah. I was in the United States Marine Corps. And I was a soldier of the sea. And as a soldier, I operated strictly under admiralty law. As proof of it, the Marine Corps flag has a gold fringe around it, demonstrating it's all in admiralty. Now, in admiralty <clears throat> law, if an officer makes an accusation against a private, it is presumed to be true because an officer is an officer and a gentleman, and gentlemen do not lie. So in consequence, in the admiralty, when an officer makes an accusation, it is true. And if you go and call the officer a liar, you want to kill all of you, you don't call an officer a liar. See what I mean? So in admiralty, everything is summary judgment. When the accusation is made, the only thing you can say is guilty. But you need to settle it up before you do that. Now, in the court system, an attorney is an officer on the good ship lollipop. <laughs> but the attorney is an officer. And he's a, well, I won't say he's a gentleman. <clears throat> but anyway, when the officer makes the accusation, it is presumed to be true. And if you go in there and say that officer is a liar, they're going to hold you in contempt every time. You can't go in and say not guilty. It's contempt. It's contempt and admiralty. See what I mean? You see the left-handed logic of how that works. That's why you cannot go in and say not guilty because you're calling the attorney a liar and the court will not put up with that. Go ahead. If you do say not guilty though, they tell you to go up to wherever the clerk asks for a court date and then you're going to come back down into the court and then present the court date that they give you for your trial. Um, if you're in contempt of court for pleading not guilty but they allow you to do it and then you can go monkey around and get your trial, what is, what is that part of the game then? Well, see, what you didn't see is when you, you pled not guilty and they said go upstairs and all that stuff, when you left the room, they said, hey, sucker, sucker, there he goes. Yeah, because, they, <laughs> because well, I was in front of the judge and the judge says, the prosecutor says, I read all your documents. He acknowledged receiving them. He says, I read them. And you got a lot of issues, but they need to be settled at trial. So you need to walk upstairs to the fifth floor and tell them because you Because you raised the controversy. Yeah, while well, my affidavit is what he was referring to. Well, I'm just telling you, though, but what you did was you raised a controversy. It was right where they want to go because the attorneys make their money on controversy. Okay. That's okay. why if you plead guilty, you can't be convicted because there's no controversy. But we need to plead guilty to the facts. Yeah. Are those the facts that I would have contained in my affidavit that they have? That you got to put into evidence. Okay, so them having it isn't in evidence yet? No. Okay. So that's the, I, I got to get that either in verbally, on the record, here it is, I have another copy, Your Honor, if you want it, I will plead yeah. guilty to these facts. Con contact the clerk of the court and say we need to hold an evidentiary hearing. Okay. I need to put evidence into the file. When I mentioned that to the clerk, Tim was with me, they looked at us like we were crazy. Well, they that's said, okay. They, they said there's no way to do that. And that's what the clerk said, that there's no such thing. I said, really? Absolutely, they told us. Tim was right there. Say, well, bring the real clerk out here. Okay, so. 
We just got to get it in their face then. Yeah, bring the real clerk out here because obviously you don't know what you're doing. Legal determination. Yeah. Uh, so probable cause hearing, legal determination, evidentiary hearing. Yeah, it's an evidentiary hearing you want to put in because you want to put evidence into the file. Because that's that's the problem where I have all this paperwork that I'm doing and I'm doing it. I'm starting to see it's pretty accurate what we've done. We're just not somehow they're not they're saying. Yeah, no. you got to put it in front of them so they can see it because you know I've, I've I've seen judges on the bench up there. You know they'll open up the file and say I don't see anything. <laughs> they do. You ever see them do that? Yeah. I don't see anything. Why? Because the judge can't see anything. There's nothing there for him to look at. Everything's over here with the clerk's file. Here's the judge's file. Here's the clerk's file. He opens up and says, I don't see anything. Okay, so evidentiary hearing, that's when we can get it on the record. And then yeah. Okay. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, they were coming after me for a whole bunch of things, and I uh, <laughs> imagine. But Go figure. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but what I did is I accepted it for value, and I put it back in, and then when I showed up at the courthouse the first time, they had it on the docket, it's a different file number. And they changed the file number on me. So I accepted that one for value. Okay. They changed it again. Every time they did it six times. There were six different files by the end of it. Holy cow. And eventually I, I pleaded guilty and uh, they sent me to jail for two weeks, but <laughs> that's the same thing. You had not resolved the thing. You right. plead you pleaded guilty prematurely. Okay. Now what uh, a, a guilty plea like that is kinda like a plea bargain. Right. And the, the judge actually turned to me and said, uh, you know, big smile on his face, you know, do you have anything to say before sentencing? Like he wanted me to do the allocution, I think he was leading me up to, but uh -huh. at that point I was so frazzled, I just said no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, you just a quick thing, um, what it appears to me then is, just as you were saying earlier, is that uh, it's a mirror image, the guilty is actually innocent. No, it's not innocent. Okay, it's but it, but it means I will pay. I'll be responsible to settle this thing. But but in, in a person's mind, when it, in our mind is like guilty, and you know, look in the mirror. God, am I guilty? Well, no, I'm, I'm not. It's just it's it's a reflection of well of, of the truth. Go right back to your New Testament again. What did Paul say? Paul said, "For all have sinned and come short of the glory." Now you gonna get from the, you gonna get in front of the mirror and say, "I'm not guilty." You're lying to yourself. You are guilty. Oh, okay. For, for all have sinned and come short of the glory. It's right there in your New Testament. That's what it says. For all have sinned. Okay, uh -huh. now, everything's a contract. You have to accept. Uh -huh. Like, I've heard, I've, I've seen court transcripts where the person tries whatever and um, is found guilty or pleads guilty. In the transcripts I've seen, they were found yeah. guilty. And then uh, I'd like to make a statement before sentencing, Your Honor. I've carefully considered your offer and I reject your offer. And then the, I've seen the court's transcripts where the judge but tries that, that's to... That's a dishonor. But the person didn't end up in jail because the judge kept saying, okay, well, I sent you, and then he said, I object, your honor, I've rejected that offer. It's the objection, not the, not the rejection. Yeah. I object is fine, but when you say I reject, that's a dishonor. Well, the, the couple of, well, my point is the couple of transcripts I saw, the judge, they were found guilty and tried to sentence them and then had to dismiss the case because the person wouldn't accept the sentence. Because they wouldn't agree to the sentence. Yes, wouldn't agree to it. Are they still in dishonor and they get to walk out and it doesn't matter? Well, they, like, they let them out from under it because they, they did not have their permission to put them in jail. Probably they'd been better off to waive the benefit privilege of the sentence or to either accept the thing and return it back to the judge for the settlement. So, uh, so if you are sentenced to jail, accept that order, yeah. accept that for value and hand it back? Yeah. And they won't physically shove you into jail then? I don't see how they could. Okay. They might, they might, they might try to, but, but see, in order to put you into jail, they have to have agreement that that be three parties signed, the judge, the prosecutor, and you. Or if you have an attorney, mm -hmm. the attorney will sign for you. Yep. But you have to have those three elements to put somebody into jail, and then they have to bond up on it in order to do that. A, a commitment order has to have a bond behind it. And so, you know, when, when the party said, well, I'm sorry, I don't agree with that. And just said, well, we agree to such. We had a guy actually bartered. And the, guy, the judge was going to send him to jail for years and years. And the guy said, he said, I can't do that much time. The judge said, how much can you do? He said, 30, I can do 30 days. Okay, it's 30 days. <laughs> so he, he just, all he did was, he, you know, he bartered with him. If he just said, I can't do any time at all, what would the judge have to have said? Okay, go home. Because remember... In a court of limited jurisdiction, which all those corporate courts are, 
They have to get the agreement of the real man in order to do anything with the real man. They have the agreement of the fictions, but they have to have the agreement of the real man to do anything against the real man. Okay. So, I mean, you know, some, some of those things were kind of... What if, what, if, what if the real man never accepts it? Then the real man's in his honor. <laughs> you get, you're back in the common what if you again. don't give him permission or what if you don't agree well then you tell him I don't agree I don't give you permission to do that then that negates that negates anything they so do so you don't have to do any of all this stuff technically not if you present it that way or like an allocution I guess and tell the at the judge. allocution you could do that and then that's, that's like a remedy no it's not a remedy it's, it's well, if it gets be, you be more like an avoidance it. it's the final straw <laughs> That would be your last. That's the last order. resort. Your last, last resort. Trouble. You last screwed resort. up and you didn't know what to do. Just reject the final option. Yeah, well, not reject. Well, wave. Not wave. 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 Or it. don't give permission. Yeah, or don't give permission, something like that. Like you would always do that, no matter what, anyways, just to cover your ass. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hold on just a second. Let me go ahead. Yeah, go ahead and change that tape. Okay. We're back, li back live again. Go over here. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm from Saskatoon, and we had a, a court case going on where some of our guys were going to court for not filing. In the case prior to that, there was this fella, he was, he, uh, he was a hard-working man, and liked to do his drink, and, and he went in front of the judge, and he beat his woman. And the judge, they found him guilty, and they suggested he takes, you know, all these different programming and stuff, and and the judge looked at him and said, and the judge had dealt with us before, and he knew we were sitting there, and he says to this guy, he says, I can't do anything with you unless you agree. <laughs> right. And I started smiling, I started laughing. I said, okay. So this guy stands there, and he made him decide what he should do. So he agreed to all the programming and everything. All he had to do was say no, walk out. Of course. Yeah. Now, so so what's, go, what's being said here is I've been there, I've seen it. And this judge is actually, was actually trying to help us, letting us know that, yeah, you're, you're sort of going the right direction. <laughs> we had a case similar to that down where I'm close to, and uh, a lady filed charges against her husband for hitting her. And when in, the judge questioned the husband and said, is, is it true that you hit her? And he said, yeah, I did, Your Honor. He said, but there was a reason for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the judge said, what was your reason? Well, he said, so we got into an argument, and she said, she said, go ahead and hit me and see if I don't haul you in the front of that old bald-headed reprobate of a judge. Judge, <laughs> 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 case dismissed. Case dismissed. <laughs> he had a reason for hitting her. What? She said, told him to. Why would I plead guilty if I would take my driver's license away and I can't drive no more? Okay, you're not you're not quite getting the. Uh... Yeah, if you plead guilty, you're saying I will settle, I will pay, and if I pay the thing, the account goes to zero. So why would they take your driver's license away? Because the court sends a letter over to motor vehicles and they stop sending no. your license. No, no, no. If you settle the account and reduce it to zero balance, there isn't anything to send over there. He and, and doesn't settle, then he's got a problem. That's true. That's what if you get Okay, yeah, if you plead guilty and you don't settle the matter, then you got a problem. That's why I'm saying you need to settle it first, first before you plead you guilty. Yeah. Like take your bond in. Yeah. What does the scripture say? Right there in Matthew, what is it, 22? Agree with your adversary quickly on your way to court, lest at any time, blah, blah, blah. You have, you have to get the thing settled before you get down to the courthouse. And if you do get to the courthouse, then you plead guilty. That reduces the criminal to zero, and there's nothing to report to anybody else because it's all gone away. We had a guy do this in the United States District Court. He went and did a set-off on his criminal case. <clears throat> the clerk of the court wrote a letter, sent him a copy of it. The letter was written to the <laughs> DOJ, and, and the, the letter read, Warning. Now this is the letter the clerk sent to DOJ, the Department of Justice. Warning. Do not put any more paper into this case. This case is 
closed. So they had achieved the zero balance, and so the clerk was warning the DOJ attorneys, don't put any more paper into this thing. We don't want the liabilities down here if things closed. And so it's the same thing. See, he settled it. He brought the set off in. He brought the zero balance. And the clerk of the court warned the U.S. attorney, don't put any more paperwork in over here. So I'm, what I'm saying to you is, get your mind wrapped around you know, what, a true, what truly a guilty plea is and what it will do for you. Well, I don't understand it because if you pay it, you're guilty. If you say you're guilty, you're guilty, take your driver's license away. Okay. What now, kind of game are we playing here? Does anybody have a mirror in here? <laughs> I mean, honestly, somebody got a mirror? Well, up in your room. But but what you need to do is 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 look in the mirror when you ask those questions because what, what you're what you're doing is you're not seeing that that the public operates as a reflection of reality. The public operates as a reflection of reality. You're looking at it from the, from the reality point of view, but you need to look in the mirror when you have this conversation to realize that, it, that it's not as it appears in the mirror. It, uh, you're having, I, just, I, can see you, I can see your dilemma. I can see it. Many people have this dilemma. You, you're equating guilty with morality, and it had nothing to do with morality. No, no, I'm, create, I'm, I'm creating associating guilty with what they're going to do. As soon as, soon as there's a guilty thing, they take driver's license when you walk. Now what are you going to do? Are you going to play guilty? You might as well fight jurisdiction or get okay, a lawyer and get it thrown away. Let me be the yeah. judge for a minute. Sir, okay. are you willing to put in a guilty plea today? <clears throat> Why? <laughs> <laughs> Sir, are you willing to settle this matter today? Yes. How will you settle it? Demand a strike. Demand a strike. No, your response is to be, I'm going to, I'm going to adjust the account and see to it that all, all people have been satisfied. I'm, go I'm going to satisfy all liabilities in this matter, Your Honor. Very well. Now what are you going to say to him? Not guilty? See, you got to set it up first. You got to settle it before you say guilty. Okay, guilty. Now what? Case closed. Then he sends the, then they send the no, thing no, down no, no, to no. motor vehicles and use Not license. If you pay. Not if it's settled. If you You've pay settled your bill first. It has to be settled first. Mm -hmm. Would Hydro cut you off if you paid your bill? You're settling it first before you say guilty. Guilty means literally in public, it means literally I will pay. That's all it means. It don't have any morality attached to it. No, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, he's concerned about the consequence. Yeah. Because he's like, I think, the part about settling the account before Well, I, I had a federal attorney tell me, he said, look, if you plead guilty, I can't convict you. <laughs> well, he couldn't. He could, not, he could not convict. Because if I put in a guilty plea, there's no controversy. And I'm suggesting to you that if you have a bond in place, a guilty plea is a snap because you have already created the set-off. Remember, the court system operates in the accrual. We get into bonding this afternoon, you'll, I think, hope maybe you'll see that. Uh -huh. And when we get into the bonding, which I'm pretty excited about, uh -huh. and you, you have your bond in place, do you need to do an estoppel and an affidavit? No, you could just say, I plead guilty, my bond's in place, I've, I'll settle the account to the satisfaction of the court, something yeah. like that? Yeah, I, I got a guy I deal with, he's in, he's in prison right now, we're trying to get him out. <coughs> Anyway, they uh, he, he went and did the bond, you know, the birth certificate bond like we did in Fort Collins. He put it into Treasury. He called me up one day and said, "Hey, I just got out of got out of the hole. He'd been in solitary confinement." I said, "What was he in there for?" He said, "They charged me with 17 charges of terrorism." I said, "For what?" He says, "For explosive devices in my cell." I said, "What did you do, man? How many beans did you eat for supper?" <laughs> Well, anyway, so they, they brought up 17 criminal charges against him and threw him in lockup. And he said, the funny thing is, he said, they brought me back out of lockup on the exact 90th day that my bond hit Treasury, and he says, and they quashed all 17 charges. So he didn't have to plead guilty or do nothing. By having the bond in place, when the charges hit Treasury, 
they went to zero because he already had the set off in place. Huh? Prepaid? Yeah, that's pre you can call it prepaid if you want to. But see, nothing could stick to him. It was impossible to stick anything to him because he had already gotten the set off in place. But what about compensation for his 90 days? That's not a very nice time of your life for well, 90 I, days. No, knowing him, he's going to get his compensation. Don't worry. <laughs> he didn't actually spend 90 days in the hole. I don't. Okay. I, I, maybe been a week. Long enough. I think all they all they were trying to do was break him down, and uh, get his. Uh, they were trying to get him to recontract out of his bond. And when he stood firm on the thing, then they had to release him and quash all the charges. Yeah. Intimidation. That's all it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. But isn't it wrong to have a bunch of bombs in your cell? And isn't it wrong to go around beating people? Like, should I, I guess it would be if he really done it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So he didn't do it. Oh no. Uh, they trumped him up. Oh, they they were just trying to put pressure on him. He. he Besides this little incident, he'd done many things in there. He's more like that fellow over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, listen, I'll tell you what, we probably are, is, uh, four minutes. huh? Four minutes. four minutes, my stomach says two. <laughs> <laughs> now, where did we go for lunch? The same place we went for breakfast? Yeah, yeah. All right, why don't you go ahead and make your announcements, because we're kind of at a breaking spot here anyway, so Can we make I just say one thing? If, if, oh, if okay, you're in court... Minute. If you're in court and you just say, okay, you say that the guy was talking about his driver's license, you say, okay, what is the value of this case? They tell you the value of it, and you say, great, promissory note, bond, and then you walk away. Can you yeah. do that? Yeah. Without pre having the bond in front hand, just asking, yeah, what is done, the value of the case? We've done that plenty they of times. The case is 10 notes. million. Here you go. They won't see you later. That. They won't say that, will they? Why wouldn't they? They have to, don't they, if you ask them the value of it? Yeah. Hey, listen, we had it set up over here in. Uh, uh, in Boston, a lady got, a lady got charged up. Some of you read it on the news, <clears throat> probably. And anyway, uh, she got, uh, husband and wife got charged up. She got the brunt of it. The judge felt bad for the lady because, you know, she was just going along with her husband who got her in all the trouble. But anyway, uh, uh, so the judge acted like he would probably do something for her benefit. And he told some of the guys back there, he says, if you'll put the paperwork in front of me, he said, I'll make this go away. And so they called me and said, what kind of paperwork would that be? And what did I say? Promissory note. And so they went and created a promissory note. And uh, they, they took it right in to see the chief judge. The chief judge looked at it and said, he said, well, it, he said this won't do. He said, number one, says, well, we tried to do a third party. We tried to write a third party promissory note. And the judge said, no. He said, she needs to be the principal on the promissory note. Number two, he says, take out the interest, because we, we were paying the statutory interest on the, on the note. He said, take the interest out. He said, we're not going to give you a refund on this. And then he said, uh, uh, wait until the day of sentencing so I can tell you the value of the charges, because he, he don't know until he reads the, the stock market report that morning to find out the value of the bonds that are going to float to pay this thing off. So he said, wait until the day of sentencing so I can give you, so I can give you a sum certain on the thing. And I thought, cool, man, we got it now. And she went and skipped. Went, Crap, man, we had it, we had it, you know. And so she skipped, but go ahead. Well, we're going to break for lunch now. We're going to break for lunch now. All right, then. <clears throat> well, one, one important concept or a couple of important concepts. We've kind of gone over it before, but I want to say it again so you get it fixed in your mind. <clears throat> that is, all, all commercial energy starts with bonds. A man can bond on his word, but a corporation has to have a surety to create a bond for it. So <clears throat> we, have, we have in existence uh, two, en two entities, as they were, we have this one here, and we have this one here. Now, technically speaking, that constitutes corporate soul. And many of you have been making all kinds of arguments to try and split those two things apart. 
And the court and the government says, but they're the same thing. You say, no, they're different things. And the court said, no, they're the same thing. Well, uh, most likely they're right. <clears throat> because <clears throat> uh, bo both of these uh, titles right here, uh, both of them are fictions. Now, the only thing that has reality is the body. The body has reality. The description of the body is always going to be a fiction. Any time you use a word to describe something else, it's going to be an adjective or it's going to be a descriptive word of some kind, and it will always diminish the thing. And so you say Winston, or you say John, or John Henry, or John Henry Smith, or all those kind of things. You're, just, you're using a descriptive word to talk about a real thing, okay? Sorry, very quickly, is that in contradistinction to a corporation soul, S-O-L-E? That's what it is. Oh, let me spell it the other way. <laughs> okay. We'll spell it that way. It's fine. Which, mean, which means doing business as one party. And so this is, this is how, how, how you're, when you're out there doing business, this is how you're perceived to be. And so, so you go into the court and start trying to make the arguments that one is not the other. The court's saying, what difference does it make? You're, you're a soul. You're a soul merchant. There's another word that comes into play, soul merchant. Basically, what it means is you're doing business on your own behalf. See, and so <clears throat> for the for the purposes of of understanding, we we split them apart to talk about them. But but after we got after we get done talking about the two separate things, put them back together again because that's how they belong. And uh, I think you'll have a whole lot less problem if you start to conceptualize it that way. I mean, when we first started to see these things, I mean, you know, years ago we were studying all this stuff and talking about the fictions and the corporations and all those kinds of things. Uh, we, we somehow in our minds become enraged that we were, we were being treated thusly. But uh, I want to tell you right now that neither one of these is my name. Both of these were given to me. It's not my name. I don't know what my name is. You know, God never told me yet. So th these are names that have been placed on me by, this one here was given to me by my uh, mother, and this one here was given to me by my government. And so these are the words they use to describe what this, here, what this is. And they can put numbers with it if they want to. That's not a problem. They can put numbers, or they can draw pretty pictures, or fingerprints, or toe prints, or however they want to do it. It makes no difference. But what they're trying to do is to distinguish between this right here and this. Which is also another corporate soul. And so what they're saying is, is that when they're, when they're talking about this, they're talking about the boundary between this and that. That, that helps you to, to, distraw, to draw the distinction between the two entities. That's all it's there for. And so you'll know that if you know somebody says, "Hey, Winston, come to dinner," that John ain't coming. See, so that's all you're trying to do is you're trying to show the difference between the two. Now, what I've done here is showed you that we have an example of a, of a bond uh, that that I wrote uh, last year. Oh, it was October the 10th I wrote that one? Somewhere in there? Yep. And, and the reason why I wrote this particular bond was because there had been certain things that I had finally figured out. I mean, we're all figuring stuff out all the time. Well, there are certain things that I had finally figured out. <clears throat> and uh, th there were certain concepts that, that had been presented to me that I finally... That finally rung in my logic system so that I could understand it. And that was that number one, acceptance creates currency. 
if you want to give credibility to a document, you accept it. For instance, what gives credibility to a Federal Reserve note? The fact that I use it. That's what gives credibility. What do you call your money here? Canadian dollars. What gives credibility to a Canadian dollar? Because you use it. Now, if, if tomorrow everybody in Canada says we're not going to use that anymore, would it have any value? No. Absolutely none. But see, it's because you give it credibility that creates the value or the energy that goes with it. And so, with any document that's presented to you, if you accept it, that gives credibility to the document. It turns it into currency. It turns it into flow. It gives it energy to move forward. See? So, <clears throat> once I understood that concept in my mind, I fixed that in there pretty good. Then I started thinking about uh, hard currency versus soft currency and all those kind of things. I started understanding the value of signatures. The signature gave credibility. It turned it in from, the, in from a soft currency into a hard currency. And then, lo and behold, I put together something else that finally came uh, to my mind. And that is, in order to create energy or currency, you have to charge it. It has to be a charged particle. Now you can go out here and you can buy a battery off the shelf and if somebody has not put energy into it, you can't get anything out of it. So for instance, say that you need a new battery for your car. You go down to the dealership or go down to the store and say, I need a battery. I say, okay, here's one on the shelf. So it's the first thing you ask them. Have you charged it yet? Because if they haven't charged it, it's no better than the one that's out here that's already dead. See what I mean? So it's the same thing when you start uh, talking about all these documents and, and accounts and stuff that we're using, they got to be charged up. <clears throat> so, anyway, I was starting to put two and two together and came up with four, then added another four and got eight and all up the line. So pretty soon I'm thinking, hey, you know, I think we got something here. <clears throat> because like I was saying, it was about this period of time that I was starting to realize that one of the deficiencies in our bonding that we had done before was, was that we had not provided a security with the bonds that we were, when we were trying to bond a fiction. And we were putting bonds in okay, but we were variously trying to use our exemption as the surety. And uh, like I say, I, I had an opportunity to talk to a man who had been involved uh, heavily in international banking. And I asked him, I said, how high up the food chain would I have to go to talk to a banker who understood the private exemption? He said, corporate vice president on a need-to-know only basis. So I'm thinking, well, how in the world am I going to talk to anybody about this? And so I couldn't. So I gave up the idea of using the exemption on my documents and so forth because simply nobody understood it. I really can't say I did something.